Hello and welcome to today's panel discussion on low temperature solders. Low temperature solders are getting used in an increasing number of applications uh, around sensitive components and other things. Uh, this panel is going to discuss today some of the methods for achieving that and what the benefits uh, are with low temperature solders. To my extreme right we have Watson Seng from Shen Mao. Uh, to his left we have Keith Swetman from Nihon Superior. To his left we have uh, Dr Ian Tevis from Safitech and to my right we have Chris Bistecki from Indium Corporation. So welcome gentlemen and thank you for joining me today. So I'm going to get straight in and, and uh, I'll start with you Watson on the end there. So what do you think are the main drivers that are driving the, the demand for low temperature solders? Uh, the biggest driving force nowadays is uh, to reduce the thermal stress to the components, the BGA components. Uh, at higher temperature, it tends to warp and uh, reduce the, the uh, yield rate of assembly. So uh, this is the biggest driving force. Uh, however, we also see some uh, complex uh, assembly uh, with the multiple reflows at different uh, temperatures. So they would like to have a higher melting temperature at first, the medium melting temperature and low melting temperature. This is another driving force to use a low temp solder. Right, okay. So Keith, would you agree with that? Uh, uh, that packaging, package warpage is, is one of the key drivers? Well, it's one of several. And I think it depends on the region. Uh, you know, I really get the feeling that in China, the need to reduce energy uh, consumption is a mm. factor. Okay. You know, that country has a, a program for energy reduction and the numbers that you see for the energy saving uh, made possible by reducing the uh, t process temperatures is significant. In the US here, uh, avoiding of warpage in IC packages seems to be, uh, and you get this strange phenomenon of hybrid soldering, mm -hmm. seems to be more of a driving force. I in other cases, say in um, wearable electronics, it's because you can use materials that are more temp temperature sen that are temperature sensitive that wouldn't survive normal temperature. Mm -hmm. So there are different reasons in different situations and in different markets. Right, okay. Uh, Ian, uh, have you any other areas that you think you can add to that? Any other drivers that you, you're familiar with? No, we, we've heard the, the same things. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and I'm guessing you're probably thinking the same, Chris, unless you've got anything... Uh, Very similar to what Watson right. said. Okay. There are other incremental improvements, but I think the main drivers uh, right. have been highlighted. Good. So, my question to you, Chris, is uh, the relaxation last year of the Rojas regulations to allow the use of, of bismuth, has that been one of the uh, uh, key elements to help you develop uh, low temperature sodas? I think it's very beneficial to, uh, to some of the solutions. Uh, when people look at low temp, the first thing they look at are bismuth tin systems, whether it's with uh, silver or they add other dopants. So most of the low temp solutions where you get a reflow around 170 to 180C encompass bismuth. So it's, it's definitely led the way for that. Mm -hmm. So it's enabled that. But there are other approaches to it also that that don't even need bismuth, but right. that that's enabled that to move forward. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Ian, you, you're, you're well. You're taking a slightly different approach, um, uh, but um, so I'm I'm going to skip you on the bismuth oh, question. Sure, yeah. Okay, for a minute, uh, Keith. What about um, the use of, of bismuth? I mean, what are you using for your low temperature alloys? Well, I mean, really, irrespective of what ROHS has done, the options are very limited. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at the periodic table, uh, the available elements that are known to be of low toxicity at least, and have a melting point in the right range, uh, if we hadn't have been able to use bismuth, I don't know where we would have gone. Right. Well, uh, maybe my friend here might have offered a solution, uh, right. taking a different approach. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there are some other elements um, that, that we're looking at as well, which would permit even lower temperatures. But look they had to release bismuth or we'd be stuck, really. Right, right. Would you, would you agree with that, uh, Watson? Yeah, we use uh, a lot of bismuth and tin and some silver in our low temp soda, of course, uh, with some uh, other dopants. Mm -hmm. And uh, the regulation from the rose uh, doesn't uh, bring uh, any uh, trouble to our product development. 
However, uh, we're looking at uh, the antimony usage because some companies, uh, they have a very high concern of the uh, usage of uh, antimony. antimony. So we try not to use this element, uh, this element uh, in our solder to prevent so, the problem in the future. Right, are they using the antimony to, to offset the brittleness of the, of the, the uh, bismuth? Or? Yeah, um, the, actually, uh, if you add antimony in your solder, mm. uh, it doesn't uh, bring uh, the hazards to, to the environment. Mm -hmm. However, uh, some uh, oxide of antimony, they are not easy to be determined or measured. So uh, the, some company uh, decide to ban the antimony at all. Mm -hmm. so that they won't have any uh, issue to determine this is her, uh, safe, this is not safe. Right, okay. I mean, Keith, one of the issues, of course, with bismuth is it's very brittle. Uh, what are the best um, other alloys to add to this mix here to, to, to try and get better uh, ductility or, or present the brittle, uh, offset well, the brittleness? The reality is there's nothing much you can do about bismuth hmm. because uh, these dopants, to use a term I don't really like that you add, don't really go into the bismuth. Um, really the only way I think the, that you can improve the ductility is to reduce the bismuth content to the level where the matrix of the solder is not bismuth but tin. Mm -hmm. And then you add things to strengthen the tin. So I think there's a bit of a misapprehension in that regard. Um, and uh, uh, the problem is of course when you reduce the bismuth content uh, to reduce its influence on mechanical properties, you start to go to a higher melting point and you get a pasty range. Uh, but it's one of these cases, as often in solder technology, where there's no good trade-off. Right. You're going to lose something to gain something. And, right. and so, you know, people have to think of the, the additives as working on the tin rather than on the business. Okay. Ian, have you done any experience working with, with the sort of... Um tin bismuth uh, type alloys um, before you uh, hit upon the current uh, solution you've got? Sure, uh, definitely the first alloys that we worked on were bismuth based because they are the lower temperature mm -hmm. alloys. Like uh, he said, there's not a lot of choices um, for there. And so our first products that we sent out for samples, uh, indium tin bismuth and also uh, bismuth tin um, for our super cooled product, uh, liquid metal uh, microparticles at room temperature ambient soldering process. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. And what, what has been the indium approach, Chris? Well, we have explored the, the common approaches with dopants and things like that. And, and it does work for some applications. Mm -hmm. uh, but we just keep running into technical challenges where it just doesn't meet it. So, you know, Indium Corporation's a, a material science company and, and we challenge our PhDs to come mm -hmm. up with some innovative ideas, things that are kind of out of the box you wouldn't think of. And there's a product that we're just announcing here mm -hmm. at SMTAI and it's a it's a mixed powder technology, and it actually is bismuth free. Because mm -hmm. we, we do, I, I think we all agree that bismuth is very restrictive as right. a solution. So we're looking outside the boundaries of using bismuth. And so you're using, you're using a mixed powder, you can't go beyond that to characterize what it is? I mean, at times we, we do reveal, but mm -hmm. it, it is patented now, and we do reveal that with certain customers and things like that. But it's, uh, we don't broadly announce it. Right. Okay. But it's a mixed powder. It's it's two different alloys we mix together, and it, uh, the resultant solder joint has no low low melt point phase, which is very critical to the reliability. Right. Because you know you don't want, when you reflow the first time you can have low melt point phases, but when you reflow the second time there better not be any around. So right. that's it's designed to to make sure we don't. Make sure you don't. What what sort of minimum temperatures are you getting down to? How, how low are you getting? So I guess with the bismuth. Out the, tin, the bismuth tin alloys, you probably reflow in the 170 to 180 range. We're more like the 200 to 210 range. So we're up a bit, but it's it's you know it's still, still less than what you're doing with yeah, current you're, you're about you yeah. know 35, 40 degrees lower yeah. than your typical process. Okay. So Ian, you've come out with a rather novel um, method for uh, having a, a low temperature uh, alloy uh, by using an encapsulation system. Can you explain a little bit about how that works? 
Sure. Uh, at, at Safi Tech, we're approaching the solder interconnect creation from a complete, completely different pathway. So instead of having a reflow step and we're heating and melting the metal, we do all the heating and melting in our lab 100 miles away from where it's going to be used. So we make a super cool liquid metal powder. So it's a, it's a micro capsule filled with regular solder metals. It's got a special shell that forms on the molten metal and then when we cool down that metal particle down to ambient temperatures, the shell protects that metal from the outside world and it prevents that crystallization until you give it a nucleation event. And so we can bring this liquid metal and we can actually flow at ambient uh, temperatures either using mechanical or a chemical dissolution process and then form that solder interconnect without having the same heat impact that a high temperature reflow process would have. But still getting the same solder metal at the very end so it would melt at the parent metal melting temperature. Yeah, so once it's out of the capsule then I assume it, it, it it then reflows, if you were to rework it again, you'd have to rework it at the, at the regular temperatures for SAC. Yes, yeah, so if you wanted to yeah. rework it, the metal would melt at 217, 220 and above. Right. So, Keith, you touched on earlier some of the benefits for driving heat out of the process, for getting the low temperatures. It, Energy is obviously a big one, it's a huge uh, saver in, in the factory. What other benefits would you get? You, would you need, you know, potentially smaller reflow ovens and things like that, so you do, you're not using up as much uh, factory space with these massive ovens? Yes, yeah, all of those factors in some markets are certainly the driver. Uh, again, I think you've got to segment the electronics market into different categories, high reliability and whatever. I can't really see the bismuth-based low melting point alloys being used in high rel applications because it's very hard to get away from the intrinsic limitations right. of, of the bismuth system. I mean, if you recall in the period when the industry was looking at finding lead-free solutions, um, when we had to get rid of lead, um, tin bismuth didn't stay on the short list for very long because in terms of what the market was expecting then, mm -hmm. uh, it just couldn't, couldn't match. So it's interesting in a way that um, there's been a change of attitude in that period since the transition for, to lead free and now where we're saying look maybe in some applications we don't need such a strong reliable joint as we thought we needed right you know it, it's like a, it's it's a downgrading you might say or you could say more positively it's not delivering any more reliability than the product really needs and i noticed that the biggest use of these low melting point solders at the moment is sort of in intermediate reliability level products right. where obviously the industry sees advantages in compromising. Right, right, okay. Um, interesting. Uh, Watson, I'm going to change the subject a little bit and move on to another topic that's hitting the headlines at the moment which is uh, in the semiconductor packaging world uh, something called heterogeneous integration. Um, I don't... Uh, can you tell us what heterogeneous integration is in your view uh, and how it and what it brings to the packaging uh, form? Um, the heterogeneous uh, uh, packaging uh, helps to reduce uh, the size of the packaging and also to shorten the uh, distance between the circuits. So uh, if you are doing a uh, uh, high speed commu communication between the circuits, mm -hmm. uh, it's a very good technology. And also, it decreases the size of package. So, if you you have a, a, like a portable wearable devices, you need a smaller package, and you can use this uh, technology. However, uh, the disadvantage is the, the heat generated from the different uh, chips. So, right. um, the package itself needs some uh, special design to get the heat out, so that uh, the, right. it, it can work. Is, is, is the compatibility of the materials used inside the package, um, would that be uh, uh, part of this heterog heterogeneous integration uh, uh, system uh, where there's less mismatches with materials and this type of thing? Um, or is it simply a, ge a geometric um, uh, um. phenomenon? Right now, we, we think the biggest challenge is how to get the heat out 
right. the package. Uh, there are many different ways you can uh, use the team materials to mm -hmm. get heat out and uh, uh, also at the same time to uh, make the size of the package as small as possible. Okay, okay. Keith, have you had any, any experience with this? Well, you, you know, we have a, this new term has been introduced, uh, but really it's just a continuation of what's been happening in the industry for decades, really. Right. Um, it's just packing as much as possible into a single substrate or into a right. single package. So um, it's a new term, but it's really not a new issue. And, right, that's uh, true. Yeah. So, somebody said to me earlier this week, it's just a multi-chip module. <laughs> well, exactly, ex yeah. exactly. That's what I'm saying, yeah. And I mean, the challenges re re remain the same. As you say, when you're mixing different materials, mm. you've got CTE differences, and the CTE differences are the, the killer right. in all of these things. So right. you, you've got to look at different materials, redesign, heat management, things like that. So mm. it's just a new name for a, a well-established right. trend. Right, okay. Um, Okay, so uh, yeah, uh, do you think there's any uh, work being done on, uh, I mean, how can I put this? Indium Corporation uh, knows a, has a lot of information about how indium sodas work with indium underfills and, and uh, other uh, materials within a package. Uh, do you think there's ever going to be any work done to try and make um, uh, the body of knowledge expand uh, so that uh, manufacturers can learn how an indium solder is going to work with a, a Henkel underfill and, a, 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 and this type of thing. Well, you, you bring up a big challenge of heterogeneous right. integration. So, mm -hmm. from our standpoint, we work on what we see a big trend is a lot of solder paste being used, mm -hmm. and it's going to very fine powders. We're going to type six, type seven powders, and and that's how you know we, we have to meet those needs. Mm -hmm. and, and we do have to be very concerned about the residues. Some, the pitch is getting so fine, it's very hard to clean the residues off. Right. So, and so that's one phase of it. The other is when you're looking at flip chip fluxes, you know, there's a trend toward no clean rather than water soluble. That's, that's a big change. Mm -hmm. And you have to make sure that the, the no clean flux residues are compatible with underfills and things like that. Right. So we do a lot of work in that area, and, mm -hmm. and we have to work cooperatively with, you know, with other, other companies. Yeah. With other companies. Codings. So, so that's driving the work that I see is transition to fine, very fine powders, type sixes, type sevens, and uh, transitions from water solubles to no cleans and compatibility issues. Right. Well, right. All fun technical challenges. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, would you agree with that, Watson? Is that uh, do you think you're going to see more? A, a cooperation between manufacturers uh, on, on materials uh, so that we can get material sets working together better and having less issues? Yeah, we see uh, the industry now needs many different kind of materials. Not like, not like the old days, you have one product and which is suitable for most of the applications. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, we have to develop the different applications just like Indian do. We, we must have a high melting temperature, medium melting temperature, low temperature, and different fluxes, no clean, no water soluble, and no low residue for, for different applications. Right. This right. Uh, increases the, the complexity of our product lines. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, well, anyway, gentlemen, I think we're starting to run out of time, so I want to thank you all for joining us today. Um, it's an interesting topic. Uh, I think the work on uh, low temperature sodas is going to continue uh, and uh, will become a bigger phenomenon probably going forward. Uh, but for now, uh, Watson Seng from Shen Mao, uh, Keith Sweatman from Nihon Superior, Ian Tevis from Safi Tech and of course Chris Bistecki from Indium Corporation. Gentlemen, thank you very much and thank, thank you, you for joining us today.